Quick introduction to me and, and why I'm uh, up front here talking about CXF. Uh, my, I'm, as he mentioned, uh, I'm employed by, by Talend uh, as the, the VP of Open Source Development. Uh, I have kind of assembled a, a team of eight people. I, if I went through the names, you'd probably recognize them. We have like JB and Sergey and, and Colm and a few others that are, are very heavily involved in Apache and that their, their primary jobs are uh, basically contributing to the Apache projects. Uh, and I've been working for, with, on web service and SOA related technologies for a very, very long time. Uh, I was part of like the, the original uh, team at Iona that was developing various SOA stuff and, and kind of went to Progress and Fuse and, and now I'm at, at Talend. Uh, so I've been working on this stuff for, for a very long time. Uh, but none of that's really the reason why I, I'm up here talking about CXF today. Uh, that's mostly because of my involvement at Apache. Uh, I've been uh, involved with CXF uh, since the beginning. I went, when CXF went into the Apache incubator, I was one of the original uh, people that were there. Uh, if you take a look at all the commits on the very first day the, uh, uh, that the repository appeared in uh, Apache, my name is, is, is amongst those uh, commits and stuff. So I've uh, been with, with CXF for a very long time. I'm, I'm currently the PMC chair uh, of Apache CXF. Uh, kind of one of those glorified titles that doesn't really mean anything, but it kind of, uh, it, it does show that I've, I've been there for a very long time. Um, I've also, along with CSF though, I've been involved with a lot of other projects at Apache. Uh, Maven uh, was the second one that I was kind of involved with, mostly because trying to get CXF to build with Maven. I found all kinds of issues with Maven and had to went through and fix them, so I got involved with that. Uh, and then, obviously, CXF builds on top of the web services stuff, so we had to get involved with that. And then, uh, obviously, Camel and Service Mix that, that are leveraging CXF uh, for their web services, uh, and Aries as well with the OSGI stuff. And, and I've contributed to patches here and there for, for a bunch of other projects and, and, thing, and stuff like that. So basically just a whole bunch of stuff throughout uh, Apache. Uh, I am an ASF member. Uh, for any of you that, that really don't know what that means, is it's uh, the every year or twice a year, the, the current members of the ASF kind of vote in additional people in the ASF. There's roughly 400 uh, ASF members, and if you're kind of curious about really what that means, uh, Shane will have, has a talk tomorrow, I believe at 10 a.m., uh, about the Apache way, and he'll go into a little bit more about, okay, what does it mean to be an Apache member? Um, one of the things that the members do every year is they vote in uh, the Board of, of Directors, and I'm currently serving uh, on the ASF Board of Directors as well. Uh, so. Uh, the, the next vote is next week, so we'll see next week whether I remain on the board of directors or not. Um, but uh, as of today, I am still I am serving uh, the, the SF on, on the board of directors. So as you see, I'm very heavily involved with, with the, the Apache projects and, and the foundation, uh, and that's really what kind of gives me the, the expertise to be able to stand up here today uh, and talk a little bit about CXF. Um, I'm sure most of you know what CXF is, so I'm really not going to go into uh, depth about what CXF in a, in a complete history, uh, because that, that could actually take an entire hour presentation. Uh, it really could. Uh, but, so I'm just going to kind of cover some highlights uh, about, about CXF. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, uh, it entered the incubator uh, many years ago, in August 2006, uh, as kind of a merger between uh, the Celtics project, which was kind of an Iona-driven project at, at Object Web, and uh, Xfire, which was another stack uh, written by Dan Deephouse, or primarily by Dan Deephouse uh, over at Codehouse. Uh, when it came into the incubator, it was one of the first projects that started a whole big controversy about whether the ASF was going to allow kind of like competing projects because we already, the ASF already had the access stack and there was a lot of overlap between the two. Um, one of the nice things about, about the ASF uh, is that uh, they're less concerned about these types of overlaps than they are about the, the communities behind the various projects. Um, so even though there was, it was kind of like an initial controversy, it really it didn't amount to much because from the ASF standpoint, it was like, well, is there a community that's willing to, to drive this that may not, may have different ideas or different directions than the current access community? Um, and like I said, the ASF was okay with that and we went forward and, and we've been very successful. I, since then, there's been a bunch of other projects that have competed with other projects. I, I don't want to really say competed because we're all at Apache, but uh, let's just say they have different ideas or, or different directions or, or maybe different priorities uh, than existing projects. And, and the ASF is, is 
quite happy to, to host those communities uh, if there is a viable community that, that says, hey, we're willing to, to, to support these projects or drive these projects forward. Uh, we did graduate from, graduate from the incubator uh, in April of 2008, so we're, talking, we're still talking ancient history here. Um, and I, since then, uh, we've, the, the community has grown really very well. Uh, as you can see, we've, we've had seven major versions, like 2.0, 2.1, like thing, uh, up to 2.6, which was released just last month. Uh, and in, this, in those several years there, we've also done 55 patch releases. Uh, one, one of the strengths of CXF uh, compared to a lot of the other projects is uh, CXF community does a very good job of fixing issues uh, and getting the fixes out into a released form that, that users can, can consume uh, and use in their projects. I, a lot of that is uh, because CXF is used in a bunch of other projects like Service Mix and Camel and stuff, I mean, if those communities hit issues, we definitely want to be able to, to support them as well. Because not only do we want CXF to be successful, we want things like Camel and, and Service Mix and, and some of these other projects that are consuming it, uh, we want them to be successful too. So by, by being able to, to have a nice regular schedule of uh, releases and fixes, it kind of helps all the communities that are involved uh, become as successful as well. Uh, CXF uh, was the first uh, Apache licensed open source JAXWIZ certified implementation. Um, actually, I think we're the, still the only Apache licensed JAXWIZ certified implementation. Uh, there was some efforts to, to get access to be certified as well. I don't know if they've finished those or not. I, I honestly haven't followed that enough. Um, we're also JAX-RS certified on the REST side of things, so that's more of a, a recent thing uh, with, I believe, two dot, CXF 2.3 was the first version to get, to get the JAX-RS certification. Um, so one of the primary things that, or primary differences between what CXF was trying to do and what Access was trying to do when we came into the incubator was CXF wanted to uh, concentrate and promote the standards based APIs and, and directions uh, and internals and things like that, and that, that which wasn't really a priority for, for Access 2 at the time. So that's, uh, again, if you have two different communities that have different types of, of visions, we're allowed, we're allowed that. And, and like I said, with CXF being certified, we, we've kind of achieved that vision. Um, we also have uh, the remote services, the OSGI remote services, or DOSGI, depending on what you want to call it. Um, the, the reference implementation that is a sub-project of CXF, uh, so that's kind of released periodically. That's not released quite as often. We need to kind of ramp that up and, and get that kind of ball rolling a little bit more. Uh, over the six years or five years, we've had um, over 33, we've had 33 committers that have committed code into CXF. Uh, in the last year, uh, 17 of them have contribu continued to uh, contribute code into CXF. So it's, it's a relatively large community of developers uh, compared to, to some of the other projects that, that are smaller. And, and like I said, 17 uh, active people is, is a significant number for some of these open source projects. Uh, and that 17 is, is very representative of a wide range of companies. I, I don't even know how many there, there are. I, I, several of those people are, are independents. Uh, obviously, Talon has a several people. FuseSource has a several people. Um, uh, JBoss has a couple of people. So, so there's, it's a very diverse uh, and, and very active community. And I'm, I'm very proud of, the, of that. I mean, it's, it just shows that, that there's a lot of ideas coming from a bunch of different directions and they're able to kind of work together to, to produce CXF, which is great. Um, CXF is, is used by all kinds of companies. I mean, this is just a, a quick kind of list of, of some of the, the big names. Obviously, Talon, because I'm here. Uh, FuseSource does, because I'm here. Um, <laughs> JBoss uses it. I, if the, the most recent versions of JBoss, the, the JAXWIZ stack, that the default JAXWIZ stack is now CXF. Uh, they used to have their own implementation. Uh, and a couple of years ago, they decided uh, it's a lot of work to maintain these implementations. And if they can leverage the communities uh, to, to do that, then that makes sense. Uh, and so they've kind of did a lot of work to, to to switch over to, to CXF as an implementation. Um, Pramati, uh, MuleSoft, uh, if you use Mule, web services in Mule, is probably the CXF stack. Uh, the new Tommy E thing that you saw all over the news, uh, the, the JAXRS and, web, and JAXWIZ implementations in their, they have their uh, web, 
uh, the web profile pack, which doesn't include any of that, but then there's the full pack, which, do, which does include the JAXRS and JAXWIZ, and that's all CXF based right now. So, and then the, the new one that I just got to put on the list last week, because it really, really surprised me, was WSO2 announced or a blog or something last week uh, that their next version of their uh, app server uh, is actually going to be supporting CXF-based web services for, for JAXWiz. Um, and that completely caught me off guard because uh, it's one of those things where I, I didn't expect to see because if, if anybody knows WSO2, they've been a, a large backer of Access 2. Um, so it, it, it it surprised me. I, I, it's great to see. I, it's obviously there, there shows that there's demand out there for, for people to, to specifically want CXF, uh, even in some of our, our I want to say competitors, but uh, again, they're not really competitors because we cooperate with them. Um, so it, I don't know what the word is for, for cooperative competitors, but that's kind of what we do. <laughs> and that's what they, the Apache is about. Uh, and like I said, it, it's embedded into like. Because CXF was designed to be very lightweight and embedded, uh, there's projects all over the place. One of, these things, one of the things that I discovered uh, like a few months ago is if you actually Google this string with the quotes, um, this is the, the title that's at the, peer, the top of the uh, default CXF web services page that lists all the services that are available in CXF. So if you actually Google that, you'll see like page after page after page of, of things that Google has found. Um, so uh, like Google AdWords, their web services is actually CXF based because you can see the, the, the services list. Um, one, I want to say TomTom, Tom, I think, one, one of them, uh, their web services based stuff is, is again, CXF based. And so you, you kind, of, kind of see it's, it's used by a, by a bunch of different applications. You'll see a lot of schools and stuff like that. So that was just one of, one of my funny things that, that I like to do periodically just to see where it's popping up and what Google has found. Um, kind of fun. So uh, somehow I lost a slide. There was supposed to be an agenda, but that's OK. Um, but so over the past year, uh, we've had uh, two major releases. There was 2.5 uh, way back in October, and like I said, 2.6 uh, just last month. So, so what I'm going to kind of go through with this presentation is highlight the major new things that were available in 2.5 and specifically in 2.6 uh, that you can le leverage in your applications uh, you can kind of leverage through, through Camel if you're using Camel uh, or Service Mix. Uh, so that you can kind of get an idea of all this new functionality. There's a lot of stuff going on. Like I said, with 17 committers, there's just a lot of stuff happening, and it's kind of hard to keep track of. Um, so I just want to highlight all this stuff, and, and so you can kind of start thinking about how can this fit in with your applications. Um, and then I'm also going to go into a little bit of what we're planning on uh, for the for the future as well. But that's uh, we'll get to that. That's a, that's a little kind of. I don't have a perfect crystal ball, but so we'll have to talk about that a little bit. Now, like I said, 2.5 was released back in October, uh, October of 2011. Uh, the major theme, if we wanted to, to highlight one big theme of 2.5, was security. Uh, we had a lot of work spent in uh, increasing the WS security stuff, uh, implementing various security for the JAXRS stuff. Um, so uh, the, the, the big theme, uh, like I said, was, was kind of going in and being able to solve security-based problems uh, with CXF 2.5. Uh, there was several, a couple of little kind of like sub-themes as well. I mean, 2.5 was the very first version of CXF to introduce uh, the idea of services provided by CXF. Pre uh, previously, CXF was really just a services framework. You could take CXF and build your services. Uh, you can use CXF just as a SOAP stack or, you, or JAX or REST stack or something like that. But CXF didn't really provide any services kind of out of the box. So with 2.5 was really the first version that out of the box provided uh, two different services. We have a, a WS notification service, which I'll cover in a minute, uh, and a security token service, which we'll also cover. So, so that was kind of a, a major new direction for CXF uh, in that it, not only are we providing the framework, we're also providing some enterprise level services that you can either use as is or, or use as a basis uh, for uh, ed, like enhanced functionality in your, in your enterprise applications. Um, we also had a bunch of WS star updates. Uh, we always do uh, like RM11 support and metadata exchange and, and some security updates, and I'll, I'll cover some of that. And then uh, JAXRS being REST and, and all that stuff, we always have a bunch of updates there. But I'll, I'll go into details on some of them. Uh, as I mentioned, the big theme, uh, 
other than security, the, the, the additional of the, of the services was a big thing for CXF. Um, the WS notification service uh, was ported kind of ported um, from the WS notification service that was a bit, that's been available in service mix for many, many years. Uh, one of the problems with the notification service built in the service mix was it was very tied to JBI. Um, if you're not deploying a JBI environment, you really couldn't leverage the notification service that was provided by, by service mix. So uh, one of the things, uh, Guillaume Nadette did a lot of this work, uh, was he kind of removed the JBI stuff uh, ended up basically just using pure JaxWiz uh, interfaces. Uh, we've had to add a couple of CXS specific hooks, but, but for the most part, um, he was able to just kind of rip out the JBI stuff, replace it with JaxWiz stuff, and kind of make a standalone uh, notification service that we can kind of ship with CXF. Uh, it's based on, uh, it kind of uses ActiveMQ as a back end for some of the pub sub stuff uh, and some of the notices, uh, partially because uh, ActiveMQ provides some nice hooks for, for uh, getting notifications out of ActiveMQ about when certain events are triggering and stuff like that. So, but, but most of that is abstracted, again, behind another API. So if we had to replace the ActiveMQ back end with something else, we, we could uh, if it can provide the, the additional functionality. Um, but that was, like, that was kind of like the, the first service that we kind of really had up and running. And like I said, that, that was ported from service mix. Uh, the other big service that we introduced in 2.5 was the security token service. Uh, this was something that, that the talent guys had been uh, working on one of our with our customers to write. Um, uh, one, of, one of our customers, basically, they, they were using STS from uh, a, a commercial STS uh, from a big company, and th that big company decided that they weren't going to support this anymore. Um, so they were looking for somebody to help them develop a new STS that they can kind of use going forward uh, in their enterprise. Uh, so they talked to us because we actually uh, have a lot of expertise in that. We actually hired one of the people that actually worked on that original STS from the first company. Um, so he already was very familiar with all their use cases and stuff like that. So, so we actually built this STS. And, and actually, one of the requirements that that customer had was that that STS get pushed back into Apache. Um, I, I've, it was kind of very interesting because they got burned once by a big commercial vendor, and they decided they didn't want to get burned again. It's like. And, and so they wanted it pushed back into a community where the community itself can kind of support this and enhance things. And, and so there's more of a long-term, uh, I don't want to say guarantee because nothing's guaranteed, but at least there, there's a, more of a community around it that's, than just the life cycle of a company. And so uh, kind of a little history about that. I, it's a production-ready STS. Like I said, that we have customers that, are, that are, have this thing in production because uh, it, it was designed to actually replace a production STS and, and it's, it's there. Uh, supports pretty much all of your, your major uh, security token things, your, your SAML, your Kerberos, and, and uh, your normal X509s and usernames and, and things like that. And it, full support for pretty much all the, the various uh, bindings and stuff. So there's, like I said, it's a, it's a full security token service that you can pretty much just take CXF out of the box, configure in your keys and what type of, of security policies that you want in place and what type of tokens you want generated, uh, configure in your, your custom like claims things that you need or something like that, uh, start it up and it's, it's a security token service that you can use. So, so like I said, those were the, the two new services that we got in 2.5 and, and kind of brought us into a, a new ballpark. Um, the WS star updates, uh, we updated the WS reliable messaging to 1.1, to one, one, uh, mostly to, to make it work better with .NET uh, and the various uh, new stuff that was in, in the newer version of .NET. A uh, bunch of testing and stuff around that. Uh, if you're familiar with WSRM, you know it's kind of a complex thing with all kinds of nuances. It also ties to various versions of WS addressing and so, and, and various toolkits use various different combinations of WS addressing and WSRM namespaces that even though the specs don't say they're supposed to, they still do. And so, so we kind of did a lot of testing to, to kind of get these various situations uh, to work together. Uh, we also added support for WS metadata exchange. So if you have an issued token in your security policy uh, with some metadata information, we can actually go get the security policies and stuff using WS Metadata Exchange. Plus, if uh, any CXF endpoint will respond to WS Metadata uh, Exchange requests. So instead of just doing a, a question mark WSDL, you can actually issue a WS MEX call to a CXF endpoint and get the information that way. Uh, not widely used other than for things like configuring issued tokens uh, in STS clients and things like that. So. Uh, 
but it's, it is something to be aware of. It does make it a lot easier to, when you're dealing with the STS to be able to use that. Um, and WS Security went through major, major, major iterations, uh, partially to get the STS working into an enterprise level thing. I mean, we had to add all kinds of stuff. Uh, at the time, we didn't support things like Kerberos and, and SAML 2. We only supported SAML 1 um, and all these various claims and, and stuff like that. So we had to do a lot of work on WS Security to, to get the STS to even work. So a lot of, if, you're, if you're dealing with WS Security stuff, I. The, the changes from 2.4 to 2.5 were massive, um, and it's still something that's, that's ongoing. Uh, and I definitely recommend people to, to go to at least 2.5, if not 2.6, uh, due to the additional interoperability testing that we did uh, with WS Security to, just to, to make the, the STS a successful product. Uh, on the REST side, uh, 2.5 introduced OAuth 1.0 flows. Uh, for any of you that are, uh, like I said, the, one of the themes is security, and that actually extended in the REST as well. Um, with REST, you don't really have all these specifications like WS security and security policy and stuff that describes how do you secure REST. So the, and the general uh, specs that you're going to use are obviously HTTPS for your encryption because that's easy and browsers support it and just about every toolkit everywhere supports it. So that, that's obviously going to be one option. But when you start dealing with authentication uh, and authorization, uh, OAuth is, is kind of like a, a rising uh, standard that, that's used. You'll, you'll see a lot about OAuth tokens and stuff like that. So 2.5 introduced the ability to kind of configure in OAuth 1.0 flows. Um, then we extended that in 2.6, and I'll cover that a little bit. Uh, however, uh, we also did some proprietary extensions to security so that if your REST payloads are XML based, you can use, leverage some of the, the technology that we wrote for the WS security side to secure your XML based payloads. So uh, if you want to encrypt a certain, the credit card numbers uh, in your XML payload based on standard, uh, X, like the XML uh, DSIGs and, and um, encryption based technologies, we have the ability to configure those, those things in and uh, the JAXRS implementation will go ahead and, and, and uh, handle that uh, in a variety of different ways. You can either envelope it, kind of like you, you do um, with uh, the WS Secure, like the enveloped and enveloping, very similar to what you do with, with the SOAP side, uh, or you can actually do detached signatures and, and things like that. So you can have like a, a separate MIME part with the signatures or, or whatever that you're dealing with. So those things are kind of proprietary, but if, you, if you're in an environment where you need to have secure REST flow, uh, data transactions, uh, you need a solution. And, and out of the box, REST, uh, there isn't really a lot of standards that, that cover some of that REST stuff. But like I said, it is all based on standard technology. It's still your, your standard XML-based signatures, XML-based encryption, things like that. So it, it's still standard technology. It's just a matter of implemented in kind of a proprietary way. Uh, in addition to that, we also uh, added support for, for SAML. Uh, SAML 2 based like auth headers and stuff. This is work that's still ongoing. Uh, as we cover new use cases, we're, we're kind of enhancing that and, and stuff like that. So that's a bunch of new stuff for 2.5. So then with 2.6, this was just released last month. Uh, I'm kind of excited about this one as well. Uh, we had the, the major theme for this one was actually OSGI. Uh, as you know, obviously, CXF's been embedded in Service Mix for years um, and has obviously worked in OSGI. So, so like one of the questions is, okay, how can a major theme be OSGI? Uh, and I'm going to cover that. There's been a lot of work done to make CXF work better in OSGI, and, and I'm going to cover that, um, as well as the security in JAXRS and, and some additional work. But the major theme was OSGI. For those of you that know Service Mix, uh, CXF and OSGI has been historically d delivered as one big gigantic bundle. So we have this CXF bundle, which is like a four and a half megabyte of class files. Um, it had pretty much all of CXF into this one bundle. Uh, now the problem, we, that came of, it worked. I mean, it was the very simplest way to get CXF running in OSGI. When we, when we started doing the service mix integration five years ago, we had this big bundle because the, the uh, I think, Deep House wanted a big bundle, so we didn't have these class paths explosions rather than little jars. Um, so to, to get us into OSGI as quick as possible, we just added the OSGI manifest to this big bundle, and it worked. It got us there. Uh, it was great. I mean, it, it's worked very well. Uh, but there's a bunch of problems with that as you get into more advanced OSGI deployments. Uh, one of the problems is CXF has grown. We, we have a lot of technology in there now. Um, but as a user, you may not need all of it. In fact, most users don't need all of it. Um, 
like if you're doing JAX RS, you don't really need the JAX WIS stuff. If you're doing JAX WIS, you don't need the JAX RS stuff. Uh, if you don't do any security WSRM, do you really need all that stuff in there? Um, so it's relatively big. But what we, so in order to solve the problem of not needing everything, we made everything optional. So all the imports are like optional. Um, which again, it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't really work well for things like OBRs that will look at the, the imports and say, okay, what do you need and go and grab them and stuff like that. Because according to the, the manifest, it doesn't really need these things. They're optional. Um, so it didn't really work well um, for those types of situations. Uh, the other problem we had with it is it was very hard to add additional OSGI specific functionality into the bundle because what the bundle was d doing was basically taking all of our little jars, squishing them all together, but for things like, um, but in OSGI you can only have like one bundle listener in the bundle. So how do you add functionality specific to one like little jar without having to write a whole framework for kind of delegating a bundle listener down to a whole bunch of, like if you're writing a framework like that, it's like, okay, you're basically just redoing OSGI anyway. So it's like, we didn't really want to do that. So there's just a whole bunch of problems with that. So, so one of the things that we wanted to tackle with 2.6 was breaking up that jar. Um, and we did a lot of work to make every single little bundle that we have uh, an actual OSGI bundles. Uh, this, it took a lot of work because uh, one of the problems, one of the reasons why we didn't do it immediately or five years ago is we had a bunch of split packages, which if any of you know in, in OSGI, that's just kind of like a no-no where you have like three jars export that need, that basically have the same package in it and classes in the same package. You just can't do that. Um, so we did a lot of moving code around um, uh, Resolving split packages, we had to kind of rename a few classes here and there and, and move and kind of actually figure out, okay, what is the API, what is the actual implementations, create little impl uh, sub packages to put the implementations. And so we did, we did, and it was a lot of work to get everything split into, into individual bundles, but and the good news is we're there now. Uh, all the little bundles are, or all the little jars are bundles. Uh, we're the use of optional is very, very minimal, and only when it really is optional. Um, so things like working with the OBR actually works better now. I mean, because you, you can actually say, I need CXF uh, WSRM capability, and it will go and grab pretty much everything that WSRM needs. And also, that way also, if you don't need our WSRM, you don't need to install those bundles. Um, you don't need, if you're only gonna be using JAXRS stuff, you can kind of skip all the WS star, star bundles. Uh, so your, your OSGI runtime, it's kind of like a catch-22. It's like, okay, you, it's smaller runtime, but you have a lot more bundles. Like if, you, like if you're in Craft and you do a list to see all the number of bundles, uh, with the previous version of CXF, if you install everything, because you only had the one CXF bundle, your, your list is actually smaller than what you would have now because you have something like 34 CXF bundles or something like that. But depending on what you need, you can actually pare down your memory usage and, and uh, number of classes and, and threads and stuff like that. So. A lot of work was done and spent into that, and that, that was very good. Now, once we got them all as individual, bun individual bundles, we could then enhance the OSGI capabilities. Because each bundle could have its own bundle activator, register its own service, uh, OSGI services, uh, integrate in with the config, uh, configuration admin service, uh, because each bundle could do that individually, uh, we were able to enhance the functionality. Uh, and one of the first things that we did uh, was kind of go through some of the common settings that users are using from a day-to-day -day basis and wire them into the config admin service so that uh, an administrator can go in and say, hey, my work queues are, are I mean, we're just getting pounded right now. My work queues are all full. Can I increase the size of those work queues? Uh, and pretty much just do that from, from the administration console. Uh, things like uh, your, where, where are your key stores stored on the machine? Uh, previously, you pretty much had to throw them into your application bundle. Uh, now you can actually have them on the machine and let the admin handle that. Your developers do their development. The configuration of the policies for how to, to use those things is done by the administrator. So uh, all this stuff now, like, so you can kind of see we, we have Jetty configuration is done uh, in the config admin, the HTTP conduits are done in the, the economy, config admin. Uh, and the work queue is currently done by, by config admin. And, and we're kind of looking for additional areas where it makes sense to, to kind of expand that list. Excuse me. Um, in addition to that, uh, because we were able to break things in, 
out a little bit. We, we did spend some more time on the various gaps that we had in the blueprint. Uh, 2.5 did introduce some level of blueprint support for JAXWIS and, and JAXRS, but uh, we it was it had some big gaps. Obviously, the, the jet configuring Jetty was a big gap that we had, so we, we added that in and uh, WSRM and HTTP Conduit. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that we actually did with 2.6 from the, the blueprint standpoint as well. So I think now with 2.6, there's one or two little gaps that we have that we can do that we can do with Spring DM that we can't do with Blueprint, but it's one of those things where, where it's those gaps are very, very edge cases, uh, and it's something that we're, we're kind of addressing as we run into them. Um, if for those of you that aren't familiar with, with the way Spring work, the CXF works with Spring, I mean, we had something like uh, 19 uh, namespace handlers sorts of different namespaces in CXF for various things. So like Jetty configuration is a namespace handler, and the HTTP conduits are a namespace, and JAXWIS, and so each of those is a separate namespace. Um, we want to do the same functionality in Blueprint. Uh, so each of those 19, you kind of have to go through and kind of port to, to Blueprint. I think we're, we're at 17 of the 19 right now. Uh, I think the, the, one of the ones that's left is around the load balancing uh, stuff, and I, I can't remember what the, the last one is, but it's another edge case that there are workarounds by just configuring the beans. You don't need the namespace. Um, so it's, it's a low, kind of low priority, but if somebody wants to jump in and help, there's, there's something for you to grab. <laughs> Again, uh, security. Uh, I have this really awesome security guy in Dublin that just kind of, uh, you turn him nuts on these security problems. Um, one of the things, that, to, one caveat I'll tell you right now with 2.6 compared, if you're porting from 2.5 to 2.6, 2.6 is much stricter about your security policies. Um, this is a, there are policies that will work with 2.5 that will not work with 2.6 uh, because we actually do more, more validation of the policies with 2.6 to make sure that they actually meet specifications. Uh, we do a lot more validation of the incoming messages to make sure that the messages actually meet those policies. Uh, we do a lot, even on the outgoing side, when we produce messages based on the policy, we make sure we have enough information to produce the correct messages based on those policies. So, so if you're going from 2.5 to 2.6 and you're using security policies, that is something to be aware of. Uh, definitely test your po policies to make sure that, uh, I mean, obviously you're going to test anyway. Uh, it's not going to be a drop-in type thing, but uh, definitely test those as thoroughly as you can because uh, we we did uh, tighten it up a lot. Uh, the, good, the good thing is we, we actually, because of that, we do reject messages that don't meet some of those policies a lot better. So uh, there's a, a lot of like attack avenues uh, that have been completely kind of wiped out due to the extra validation, but that, that's a good thing. But just keep in mind, you have to test. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, the security token service that was introduced in 2.5, we've continued to, to push that forward. Uh, it supports the, the uh, renewal binding now. Previously, we just did the issue, the cancel, um, and the validate bindings. Uh, and if the, a token expired, you'd have to go back and issue a new one. We actually support the renewal binding now. So if the client knows a token is expiring, it will go ahead and, and renew it. Um, it kind of just saves some of the additional processing and, and stuff like, and things like that. Uh, Bunch of plug extra pluggability in the token service for, for handling uh, complex claims and things like that. Um, bunch of, like I said, bunch of stuff around that. Uh, the big thing additional that we in in, in two six uh, is we've uh, we're I think we're now the the uh, only like open source like. WS security implementation that uses a complete uh, e EH cache based uh, caching mechanism for security tokens. So when, you're, when a username token comes in that has a nonce in it um, or uh, the timestamps, uh, we actually can record those things in the EH cache based, which is a disk based caching mechanism. Um, so we can actually detect replay attacks now. Uh, and reject messages based on the replay attacks. Uh, previously, we had it. We you could you could do it previously, but it was a memory-based um, uh, store, basically just a hash map of, of like key, uh, or I want to say a hash set of nonces or whatever, and just does a, is like contains. So if your application shut down and came back up. Uh, that whole map was gone, and, and you really couldn't do anything. Uh, or if you kind of have a, a distributed ESB and you need to kind of like uh, mesh things together, you would have to do a lot of, of writing custom code to do that. Using the EH cache now, uh, you can actually restart your application. The cache comes right back up. You still have complete uh, secure security around the nonces and timestamps and, and things like that. So uh, 
very, very important, like I said, for, from an enterprise level security, uh, these types of features are very important uh, for, for being able to, to say my application is secure. Um, Jack's RS side, uh, the big thing for 2.6 two, for was the, the start of the OAuth 2.0 support. Uh, like I said we had 1.0 for, for 2.5, we've added 2.0 for, for 2.6. Um, uh, 2.0 uh, adds a lot more functionality, there's a lot more uh, uh, things that you can do with the various flows and claim processing and stuff like that. So uh, being able to, to claim lo some level of support for that uh, is a major new feature on a JAXRS security standpoint. Um, that's, we have initial support there, we have a simple sample that shows some of it working, but it's also something that's work in progress. The, these OAuth specs are kind of complex. There's a bunch of edge cases. There's some concentrated cases. We're working on the concentrated cases. Um, but again, if you, if you want to try it out, I definitely encourage you, and if you run into any issues, just let us uh, go to the, the mailing list and, and kind of get involved and say, hey, this is a case that isn't quite working yet, and we'll, we'll see if, it, it may just be a one or two line change or something. We, that's, that's actually occurred a couple of times where, where somebody said, hey, this isn't working, and we kind of look at the code like, Oh, it's just we never turned it on. It was experimental at one point, we just never turned it on. We just flip a switch and it kind of works. So um, definitely encourage people to, to, to try it out. A uh, bunch of additional, like, a lot more of the JAXRS stuff is pluggable. So your context providers are pluggable. There's, there's uh, various, uh, again, like SAML things with the OAuth stuff that you can kind of plug in some custom uh, validation stuff, uh, claims processing stuff. There, there's some more uh, security uh, related uh, token things with JAXRS that you can kind of get involved with as well from a, from a pluggability standpoint. Uh, so again, one of the, the things that we wanted to do from a JAXRS standpoint was, was really figure out how it would interact with some of the, the security stuff that we're working on. Uh, going forward with that, one of the things that we're also doing is, is with the STS is try to see if we can get JAXRS services to grab tokens from the STS. Uh, and embed them either as like uh, HTTP headers if you're using like the, the fingerprint. So you can do like a SAML fingerprint as an HTTP header or possibly as like a separate MIME chunk uh, on your REST-based thing. So, so we're, we're definitely got a lot of ideas uh, around uh, how we're going to secure some of these REST things. Uh, and that's kind of, a lot of what you're seeing in 2.6 is kind of the base for where we're going with that. Um, uh, we also, uh, I, some of you that have been working with REST have heard of cores. This is one of those specs that I almost know nothing about. Um, but if you're a heavy REST-based person, you have to deal with these, these it's called cross-origin resource sharing. Uh, CXF, JAXR implementation, does have a module now for, for handling cores requests. And you can kind of configure these, these cores uh, components in and, and to handle some of these cross-origin things. Um, I, I've seen some people. Uh, Actually, just one of the reasons why we, we moved it into a new, it used to be as part of the JAXRS core, but we actually moved it into uh, a separate module because the, uh, the Wink team actually, uh, Apache Wink is another JAXRS implementation at Apache type things in the incubator. Um, they were actually talking about grabbing the CXF cores module and seeing if they can use the cores stuff uh, with Wink uh, because we had developed this. And, and uh, so uh, again, pulling it out into something that's, that's a little more shareable kind of makes sense, uh, not just from a CXF standpoint, because you can, if you're not using cores, you can exclude it. Like I said, the bundles, you can kind of exclude what you don't need. Um, but it also helps with some of the community development to be able to kind of share these things with some of the other communities that are out there. Um, again, SAML stuff, things like that. So a lot of, a lot of work done on JAXRS. Uh, like I said, we have a, a, another really good REST guy, Sergey. He's uh, based in Dublin as well. Uh, does amazing things with REST. Uh, it's, one of the nice things to me about uh, the CXF community uh, is it is very active, but my, I myself doesn't really need to concentrate on everything because I have re there's really good guys there that know this stuff, those technologies so much better than I do um, that you can kind of rely on something. Like I said, Sergey is very good with REST, Column is very good with, with security, uh, and so I just don't even have to, uh, if one of those questions come up, I say, hey, that's them, I don't need to research it. So. Uh, and also at 2.6, we spent quite a bit of time uh, doing some profiling for, for various specific use cases. I mean, for, for Talon, we had certain customers that were running into various issues. Uh, and we, we did spend some time looking into to some of that stuff to figure out what we can do. Um, uh, one of the things that we, we did uh, with the JMS transport, we've, we've, CXF has had a JMS transport way back since the initial 2.0 release. Uh, 
it's evolved since then. We've added the support for the JMS spec, and, and uh, we've added additional capabilities for configuration. So it's evolved over time. But one of the things that it's always done, uh, because the internals of CXF always expected an input stream, uh, which is bytes, byte-based, uh, if you're using JMS with a text message, it would always convert to a byte array byte array input stream, and then pass that through the rest of the CXF. So, so if you're doing something like ActiveMQ, text message, it goes base64 encoded across the wire. ActiveMQ would create a string. We would take the string, convert a byte array, and then pass that through where then it gets parsed. Didn't make a whole lot of sense. So we actually did some, some performance. We went through the entire CXF core, all the interceptors um, that were expecting an input stream, and actually now allow them to uh, expect a reader or a writer now as well. So we can do a string reader or a string writer uh, to keep these things as text. Um, so again, that, from a performance standpoint, that's huge. I mean, we're doing a lot less encoding, uh, encoding and decoding uh, of these, these byte things uh, and just kind of let, let the underlying JMS implementation handle that. Um, so if you're using JMS transport, that's, that's going to be huge. Uh, and obviously there's memory reductions and things that, that go along with that. Uh, we spent a lot more time getting rid of Spring. Uh, for those of you that follow CXF, this has been one of those ongoing things where CXF 2.0 and 2.1, 2.2, I mean, we're really, really heavily Spring-based. Uh, if you're trying to use CXF without Spring, you could almost do almost nothing with it um, without Spring. Over with 2.3 and 2.4, uh, we started kind of reducing uh, where we needed Spring. Uh, you still needed Spring for various configuration things uh, and loading various plugins and stuff like that. Uh, we've gone further with 2.6, and, and now uh, you can pretty much use everything in CXF other than the JMS transport without Spring. Um, the, partially, the JMS transport is tied to the, the Spring JMS messaging uh, the, yeah, the Spring messaging framework stuff, partially because it's a lot easier to use than the pure JMS APIs and actually supports things like uh, reconnects and failovers and, and things like that that we just don't get from pure JMS. So it just makes sense for JMS. But for, for the most part, everything you can do uh, works fairly well w without Spring. Uh, part, part of the driving for behind that was the Blueprint support. Because obviously we want to be able to use Blueprint instead of Spring DM. So decoupling the Spring usage from the actual core allows us to do, have the Blueprint implementation that doesn't depend on Spring. Uh, and that was kind of an important driving thing, uh, again, for, for 2.5 and 2.6. We spent a lot of work on that. Uh, and I, companies like JBoss are ecstatic about this because they, uh, obviously their app servers are big enough as it is. Uh, they didn't want to be sucking in all of the Spring jars as well. So. Uh, they were one of the ones that were, were extremely happy when the, this idea of, of creating a bus without Spring uh, popped up. And it, it ends up being a lot quicker because Spring also had a tendency of parsing a lot of XML up front and we kind of got rid of all that. And so uh, it helped our startup uh, and memory allocations and stuff like that. So, but then we also did a lot of profiling uh, with memory allocations and things like that and discovered a bunch of schemas that were parsing up front that we didn't ever even use in 90% of the time. So we kind of delayed them until they were needed. Um, so uh, there, there's just things like that that, that I mean, by bringing thing, CXF applications, like real applications and some of the CXF demos up in a memory profiler and you're like, why is there 6,000 hash maps sitting there? Or why are there 5,000 uh, DOM elements in memory when my WSDL is a hello world WSDL? Um, so uh, you, you kind of like look at these things and, and go, something's wrong here. Uh, and you kind of spend some time looking at it and, and say, uh, kind of digging through and, and, and figuring these things out. And so 2.6 does start up quicker, lower fo footprint. Um, and again, part of that is uh, triggering our OSGI little bundles, use what we need, let's, let's minimize the environment, and, and we're getting there. Uh, from a scalability, uh, again, along with the, the performance stuff, we did some scalability things. Uh, one of the things that we kept asking, people asking about, our customers asking about, okay, we have, JackSwiss has all these async APIs on the client side. You can say, uh, echo foo async and pass a handler so when foo comes back uh, you'll get notified so you don't have to wait for it on your main thread. But there is nothing in JaxWiz for how do you do that on the server side. Um, partially because JaxWiz is very HTTP oriented um, and with the version of the servlet spec that was available when JaxWiz was kind of written there wasn't really any option for that. So they didn't even cover it. Um, so for, for 2.6 we added uh, this new uh, use async method. I'm, which allows us to use the exact same methods on the server side as we have on the client side. So you, if you generate the async methods, uh, you can mark in your impl uh, on echo, like if you have like string, echo foo, string, 
you can also have the, the generated uh, void echo foo string uh, async handlers or response, I can't remember exactly what it is. The, the, the standard JavaScript stuff, and you, can, and you can tell CXF, use that other method instead, and, it will, and CXF will pass a handler into it, and you can kind of jump onto another thread, do a whole bunch of processing, and, and uh, if the underlying transports support it, CXF will be happy to then uh, handle the asynchronous cases and not consume that transport thread. So for, for Jetty, like our, we embed Jetty for our HTTP service, um, or if you're using a Servlet 3 container like Tomcat 7, um, where we have the ability from the transports to do asynchronous uh, responses, uh, or even obviously JMS because of the, the general uh, asynchronous nature, uh, CXF will handle that for you. You don't have to consume, he basically hold on to these transport threads. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, we don't have to hold on to these transport threads while uh, you're processing. So if you have a long run, like something that's going to take, I, even 30 seconds can be long when you're dealing with web services. So if you have something that you know is going to take 30 seconds, throw a thread and uh, use the async methods, start a thread, start a uh, pool, or, or if you have a database that will give you a notice that, that when the data is available, uh, use that capability and don't tie up your Jetty thread so you can have more requests coming in. Um, very, very important from a scalability standpoint. Um, so what's next? Uh, that kind of covers everything that's new in 2.5 and 2.6. Uh, we obviously have a lot of stuff, uh, kind of a lot, a lot of visions going on. Um, so the question always is, what's next? Uh, well, the number one answer at Apache is, what does the community want to do? Where does the community have itches they need to scratch? Um, that's the, the, the basically, at Apache, the, the number one answer is, is or, or response is, is basically, those that are actually doing the work are the ones that really have a say in what's going to happen and where things are going to go. So if you guys have a particular problem that you need solved, get involved, submit a patch, whatever. You, you have control over the, the direction of the, the project. Um, so and that's, that's the number one answer. Now, from my personal standpoint and, and Talon's involvement in the stuff that I know about, uh, we have a bunch of stuff kind of going on. We have a new uh, Fetis, Fetis, I don't even know how Dolly pronounces it, subproject. Uh, kind of has plugins into various, uh, it's going to have plugins in various app servers. Right now we just have Tomcat uh, and WebSphere uh, plugins, but we, we're going to be working on some others like WebLogic and JBoss that provides uh, implementation for the WS Federation 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 and passive web requester profiles. Um, so if you, again, this is a security related technology where you can kind of Using, using the various headers and WS Federation spec, uh, you can secure your applications and, and kind of handle some of the single sign-on scenarios and things like that. Again, this is one of those things where it's really, really cool stuff, um, but Ollie and Column have a really good handle on it, and so I don't know a whole lot of details about it. Uh, and that's good. I don't need to. Uh, they're, they're doing a great job with it. But it's a new project that, that we're kind of uh, like to see more people getting uh, involved with as well. Uh, Colm's working a little bit uh, in WS Security on a streaming version of XML Security. For right now, we use WSS for J1.6, uh, which basically builds an SAJ model or DOM model to do the security processing. So if you have very large messages, that's a problem. Uh, we actually have uh, a prototype of uh, a streaming version where you can actually, like especially on the incoming messages, where you can process the security events in a streaming form. Should be able to handle the large payloads and large messages a lot better. It's also uh, a lot faster. So that's kind of an ongoing work. Uh, I've started doing some my personal uh, kind of doing some prototyping around WS Discovery. So clients and services like services can advertise themselves when they come up. Clients can say, "Hey, I need a service that does this," uh, and they can kind of talk to each other to, to discuss auto discover things. Uh, .NET 4 supports WS Discovery fa fairly well. Uh, so it's one of those things that kind of give us a little bit of extra interoperability and, and from a federation standpoint, uh, like a federated scenario type thing. So uh, I'm just kind of prototyping this stuff. I don't know where it's going to go. It's just kind of these things where I kind of have ideas that I'm kind of playing around with. Um, obviously, there's all kinds of stuff related to, to REST that, that Sergey has visions on, specifically around security, OAuth 2 enhancements. Again, uh, if you have specific request needs or, or, or bugs or issues, bring them up. We're, we're willing to to, to take a look and see what we can solve with them. Uh, and then my, my kind of pet project is, is still the async stuff. Uh, again, it's, it's 
the Jack's Wiz spec has never really kind of gone into some of that stuff, so I'm, I'm kind of been playing around a little bit more with the async stuff to, to kind of enhance the scalability server side uh, as well. So we, we had good bases there, and we're going to keep going with that. So, so that's kind of uh, where we're going. But again, uh, uh, obviously, it's an open source community. I want people to get involved um, with that. So definitely have. Get involved with that if you can. Uh, from a Camel standpoint, I'm also on the Cam Camel PMC. I do a lot of work there. Uh, we we did a lot of again performance tuning and stuff of, of the the Camel integration with CXF, uh, specifically with payload mode to support streaming. Again, Camel was building DOMs of all our messages, and I didn't like that. So when you have big messages, we didn't it didn't work very well. So we fixed that. Um, we, we're starting to work on, on figuring out how to get the CXF messages to be pro processed better in Camel. I, one of the problems with Camel is if you want message mode as opposed to payload mode, CXF won't handle some security like validations and things like that. So we want to introduce a new mode that mimics the CXF uh, messaging mode that allows us to, to use, leverage the, the security capabilities, stuff like that. And again, uh, this is all Camel stuff that, that we have visions. But again, it's, it's the CXF community, the Camel community kind of working together to, to solve real world problems. Um, for more information, uh, I, I, this is just a bunch of links and stuff. Uh, again, uh, you can contact me, although I prefer people to just go on the CXF lists. Uh, they're very important um, to get involved with the communities itself. Uh, for information about the various topics, specifically for uh, security and uh, REST, uh, I, like I said, Calm knows security, like back of his hand type type thing, and, and Sergey, I call him Mr. REST because he does everything REST related. So whenever they're, they're doing kind of new ideas, they'll, they'll kind of blog about it to kind of get information and, and feedback from people. So, so definitely encourage that. Um, so that's places to go. And that would be it. So any, is there any questions about, I mean, there's a lot of information there about where we are and where we weren't, went, where we're going. So does anybody have any questions? Do you know if there are any kind of work going on on folks around the CFF? Because Yeah, there, there's the two books. There's the, um, there's the, I can't remember the names of them. There's the one that's devoted specifically to CXF uh, by Ravi. Um, and then there's another one that's like Access 2 and CXF kind of combined. Uh, those are the only two that I'm aware of. I'm not sure if there's anything newer uh, that has come up. Uh, other, I mean, the only thing I would suggest is I both FuseSource and Talend have uh, a lot of documentation available as well in their products. Uh, I don't know, JBoss might as well. I don't really follow that as well. So I, I mean, uh, all the documentation on the STS is actually, if you go to Calm's blog, actually, he went, he did a, a, I think it was like a 14 part series of blog entries on the STS and configuring it. Um, so uh, again, that's a very good resource for that. Uh, Sergey does good work on the rest stuff on his blog. I mean, some of that get, does get back into the CXF documentation eventually, um, but a lot of them, because it's, it goes on their blogs first to kind of like solidify thoughts, get feedback, and then it kind of goes into, like the talent documentation uh, is taken from their blogs, uh, and obviously the, the CXF website as well. So, uh, wish I had a better answer, but that's all I know at this point, so, yeah. Yes, in your presentation, you said uh, the input message only accept like uh, string, uh, like string as an input message type, as text. So do you... For, for JMS, yes, yeah. Uh, does it acceptable the, for the uh, binary? Messages? Uh, inside of CXF is basically, uh, if you took a look at runtime, it's just a series of interceptors. Uh, and it just depends on what the interceptors themselves are expecting. Um, for ex so the initial set of interceptors that kind of come in off of a transport, we're accept expecting the message to provide an input stream or an output stream. And that's it. Um, we've enhanced those interceptors to also support things like readers and writers. However, there's other interceptors that can, can transform those things. Like, like for example, gzip. Uh, it will take an input stream and replace it with a new input stream that does the unzipping. Um, however, there's also transports like the Corba transport that obviously doesn't use byte arrays. Um, what they do is they don't set either of them on the message. Like the, the, the initial 
interceptors, either it's going to be an input stream or null. Like it wouldn't be there. It would just skip. So we had to add the readers and writers. Um, the Corba basically provides uh, an XML stream reader that kind of wrappers the, the DII style, uh, like dynamic skeleton. Like I can't, God, my Corba days are like so long beyond. It's like, escaping my brain. Um, but basically, it's the XML stream readers and writers that, that wrapper the, the dynamic things in Corba. I don't remember what they're called. Um, so it's, it's really not byte arrays coming in off of Corba. It's the, these dynamic skeleton things uh, that they do. So it obviously, all those initial interceptors that deal with streams don't do anything with that. They, they see that there's not an input stream there, and they continue. So that's how CXF is kind of designed, is, is OK, where is it going to go, and what do we need to do to support additional things? So. Thank you. Yes. How easy is to um, configure and deploy your own security model right now? Uh, it depends on what type of security model you're... you're well, you can only type on your store, type on the APIs, and uh, basically form notification APIs. Is it easy to plug in all security models? Uh, it depends on where you're trying to plug it in. I mean, like obviously, like into the STS, if you want to just produce custom tokens, that's one thing. Yeah, I mean, CXF interceptors are easy to configure, and, and when you're in an interceptor, depending on where you're in the chain, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Uh, you can take a look at the incoming message and say, this is just bogus, throw an exception and let it go. Uh, you can use information from the message to authenticate, author, authorize, whatever. Um, and it's actually become easier with 2.6 because we actually have security token API, like security objects um, that are expected to be there or not expected to be there. So you can actually just handle the authentication, provide a security object, and then the rest of the CXF stuff can stay the same. So there's, there's a lot of options there. Um, again, uh, ask Calm, he would know. <laughs> so. so anyway, I think our time is up. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming and a lot of information.